breaking the wall to our microbial self. How microbiome research redefines our idea of being human. Rob Knight, University of California, San Diego. On the 9th of November 1989, I was in German class towards the end of my first year of high school. I realized all of my textbooks were obsolete. Uh, thank you, and I'd like to thank the uh, Falling Walls Foundation and uh, the organizers for putting together this remarkable event and uh, inviting me to participate in it. Um, what I'm going to tell you about is a new wall that we're breaking down that leads us in many ways to redefine what we think about ourselves as human beings. And, uh, and I want to begin by, uh, leading, uh, by asking you to consider, what did you see this morning when you got up and looked in the mirror? Just take a moment to think about that. I saw an organism that's 43% human, and uh, not just because I just got in from another time zone and I hadn't had my damn coffee yet, but uh, what, when we think about what it is that makes up our bodies, we're really redefining uh, what it is that makes up the human system. And if we think about it in terms of the cells that make up our bodies, each of us has about 30 trillion human cells, but uh, the current estimates are that we have about 39 trillion microbial cells uh, on and inside our body. So by that measure, we're about 43% human. Now, you might be thinking, well, wait a moment. Uh, isn't it really our DNA that makes us a human, the human genome and so forth? So let's think about it at that level for a moment. Each of us has about 20,000 human genes, depending on what exactly you count. But the size of our microbial gene catalog ranges from about 2 to 20 million microbial genes. And so by that measure, we're at best 1% human. And what's remarkable about that when you think about all the enthusiasm for systems biology, systems medicine, is that in many ways we're, regard, uh, we're neglecting 99% of that system when we disregard the microbial sides of ourselves. So what's making all this possible is that we can map our microbiomes like we have never been able to do before. And to do this, we have to break the walls of the Petri dish and of the laboratory. So if you know any microbiology at all, you probably think about this as a classic, uh, classic gut bacteria. And if you, want, if you know one microbe name, it's probably this one, E. coli. But you don't think of this as a classic microbe that's in the gut because it's actually a dominant player in that ecosystem. In general, if you're healthy, less than one out of a million cells in your gut belongs to E. coli. We just know so much about it because it's really good at growing in captivity. Unlike the vast majority of microbes whose names you've never heard of, who live inside there. And so in many ways, when we try to study this with methods that depend on culture, it's kind of like going to the zoo and trying to understand each animal by looking at it in its cage, knowing nothing about the other animals or the environments that they interact with. So what we have to do instead is we have to go to the microbes where they are and uh, analyze them directly. And we do this by sequencing their DNA. And it's really the advances in DNA sequencing technology that have led to this remarkable revolution. And for example, in the Human Microbiome Project, together with a consortium of about 400 researchers uh, around, uh, around the world, uh, we collected about 4.5 trillion A's, T's, G's, and C's to decipher the genetic code of the human microbiome. And so, um, and so this was amazing, right? Uh, it's about 1,500 times the size of the human genome. And um, the problem with that is that we have this big data challenge. So I'm just going to show you the first file of data from the Human Microbiome Project. This is fundamentally an ecology project, but it's pretty hard to tell from that who lives where, right? And uh, what, I'm, what I'm showing you is just the first 0.1% of this file, and there are another 17,000 files just like it. And uh, this sort of big data challenge is really a problem now that the microbiome is escaping the lab and getting out there into public consciousness, because you have a lot of people now who are starting to get their own microbiome readouts. And they're coming to their doctors and they're saying, hey, I got, this, I got my microbiome sequenced, and now I have a list of a thousand species that are in my gut. And surely, with all this information about my microbiome, you can tell me what's wrong with me, right? And what's your poor physician going to do? I mean, at the moment, they can only refer you to their colleagues in psychiatry for being crazy enough <laughs> to think that it's going to help and that they can explain it to you in the 15 minutes or whatever you have together. But, uh, but the challenge for our field at the moment is to make it not crazy anymore and to figure out how to take your information and integrate it with information from thousands of other people, healthy and unhealthy, to start to make sense of what all it means. 
Uh, so in my lab, we have, uh, we, we have this wonderful collaboration between microbiologists and computer scientists uh, to put together techniques that allow us to take all that information, like from the Human Microbiome Project, and create a map of where the microbes are. So the way to think about this map is that each point on this map represents all the complexity of a microbial community read out by its DNA. So for example, this oral microbial community is condensed down to just one point, and two points that are close together are more similar in the evolutionary history of the microbes that live there, and two points that are further away are more distant in terms of the evolutionary history of their microbes in those communities. And when we color by the part of the body that each sample is from, we immediately see the main pattern in this map, almost like different continents. And to put this in perspective, if I show you the mouth and the gut of the first person in the Human Microbiome Project, what you can see, uh, that's where those yellow dots there, uh, you can see that the mouth and the gut are in completely different regions from one another. But it wasn't until we did the Earth microbiome to look at microbiomes from all over the planet, uh, not just in our bodies, and to look at the soil and the water and the air and so forth, that we truly understood how profound these distinctions were. Because if you think about your mouth as being kind of like this coral reef, uh, complex mineralized structures covered with biofilms, perhaps your dentist pesters you about those from time to time, then the remarkable fact is that your mouth is as far away from your gut in terms of its microbial ecology as this reef is from this prairie. And that's amazing when you think about it, right? It means that uh, less than a meter along the length of your body can make as much difference to microbial communities as thousands of kilometers across the Earth's surface. So each of us has a unique journey uh, through this microbial map. And uh, what we can now start to do is we can start to trace it from birth to death. And as you might imagine, how we're born has a tremendous impact on our first microbes. So for example, if you're delivered by C-section, you start off with very different microbes than if you're delivered vaginally. And then we can trace what happens after this. So this is work we did with Ruth Lay, who's now a director at the uh, MPI in Tubingen. And what we're doing is we're tracing the journey of one child over the first two and a half years of life, just looking at the microbes in the gut. And we can connect the points up one week to the next to the next to understand how this, uh, how this, uh, how this child travels through the microbial map. And in case you're wondering why it ends at two and a half years, that's when the kid was toilet trained. And you can imagine it's a lot easier to get, these, uh, to get the samples out of a diaper than it is to fight a toddler who's proudly learned how to flush for every single sample. So these studies tend to end at about that time. So I'm just going to start this going. And you can see that sometimes there's tremendous change one week to the next. Other times, there's just a little bit of change. And remember that what matters on these maps is how far apart two points are. And so if you're, if you're thinking that your kid seems like a different person one week to the next, that can literally be true in terms of their microbiomes, which remember the majority of their cells, because sometimes these distances uh, one week to the next are bigger than the distances separating any two healthy adults uh, that we saw in the HMP. And coming up here is something fascinating. So you, uh, so you see he gets antibiotics for an ear infection, and you see that tremendous uh, regression followed by recovery of the microbiome. And that went by pretty fast, so I'm just going to rewind it for you and uh, show it to you again. And remember that each frame in this is one week in the developing microbiome. And what you see is that on administration of oral amoxicillin, you see this tremendous, you see this tremendous regression of the microbiome, undoing months of development in a few weeks, and then a relatively rapid recovery. And then by the time we get up to two and a half years, he's basically in the healthy adult region of the map. But that doesn't happen with every child. Uh, everyone responds differently to antibiotics. And one thing we're doing at the moment is trying to put together a microbial growth curve, so it's kind of like the height and weight chart you see at the pediatrician's office, but showing you whether your kid is on track for their microbial development. And these effects of antibiotics really lead us to wonder whether controlling individual species of pathogens have led to a silent spring situation in the, in the gut. Because over the 20th century, as diseases from measles to tuberculosis caused by single microbes have been brought under control, we see an explosion of non-communicable diseases, including multiple sclerosis and Crohn's, and diabetes and asthma, where all, of those, uh, where, where, where all of those involve the immune system. And what fascinates me is that in 2002, when this article was published, none of those chronic diseases had been linked to the microbiome, whereas today, all four of them and dozens of others have been linked to the microbiome. And uh, Marty Blazer at NYU has written this wonderful uh, book-length treatment, if you're interested in more about that. So, um, so one additional disease that's been increasing and frequently rapidly that I've been studying for the last decade with Jeff Gordon's lab at WashU and others is obesity. And for example, today I can tell you with 90% accuracy if you're lean or obese based solely on the microbes in your gut. 
So on the one hand, this is a cool trick from a technical perspective. On the other hand, you're probably thinking, um, I don't think that has a lot of commercial potential as a test for obesity, because I can tell which of these people is obese, not knowing anything about their microbes at all. But if we try to do this based on human genes rather than microbial genes, we can only do this with 57% accuracy using human genes versus 90% accuracy from microbial ones. And I'm going to show you something that's really going to astound you. If we look at this map of antibiotic prescriptions in the United States in 2010, uh, sorry, look at this map of obesity in the United States in 2010, and then look at this map of antibiotic you know, prescriptions, you can see a tremendous resemblance between those two maps. So if you use more antibiotics, you're more likely to become obese. And this, is, uh, th this makes you think uh, in terms of uh, using antibiotics to promote growth in livestock, um, and also in terms of epidemiological studies that have shown that early life antibiotics are linked to obesity. But when we think about obesity, a lot of the time we think instead of diet. And there have been some really groundbreaking studies, studies of diet. For example, this one, um, looking at, uh, at 120,000 people over 20 years, tracking the effects of individual food items. And what's remarkable about these studies is how small of an effect, when you look at the population average, individual dietary items tend to have. So if we look at the worst and the best foods in the study, it might not particularly surprise you that this is the worst food in terms of weight gain over 20 years. But what might, what might surprise you is the size of the, of the effect. So an extra serving of fries every single day uh, leads to only a gain of about three quarters of a kilo a year. Now you might be a little bit more surprised about the best food in terms of weight loss, which is this one. But every additional serving of yogurt per day uh, leads to a loss of only about a third of a kilo per year. And that's pretty remarkable, right? Because if every single day for 365 days you forewent the fries and ate yogurt instead, uh, may be a pretty big sacrifice for some of you. You're only talking about a kilo difference in your weight at the end of that time. Now, however, this is different from everyone's individual experience where, where you know um, that if you cut out a particular food, maybe that'll have a large effect. Uh, but if, if your friend cuts it out, maybe it has no effect or they go in the opposite direction. And a remarkable study published at the end of last year uh, really starts to get into this, where they took 800 people and linked them up to continuous glucose monitors and took a defined sequence of meals so they could track the effect of every food item. And uh, what, what they were able to see was that the effect of the same food is totally different depending on your microbiome. And so part of the punchline here is that for some people, it was actually better to eat a bowl of ice cream than a bowl of white rice in terms of their blood glucose control. And on learning this, a lot of people uh, initially want to know, well, is there a test I could do to find out if I'm in the ice cream or the rice category? And the answer is yes, but it only works right now if you're Israeli. It needs to be refit in other populations with different microbiomes and different food items. Um, but then the more interesting question is, could I change my microbiome? So if I'm, I'm in one category, could I move it into the other? And we know that we can change our microbiomes uh, for, for therapeutic effect. We also know that some of these effects are very large. So for example, in the American Gut Project uh, that I run, um, looking at, looking at where, uh, which uses crowdfunding and, and uh, crowdsourcing to let uh, citizen scientists place themselves on the microbial map, we've looked at almost 10,000 people now, and we can look at what has a large effect and what has a small effect. And amazingly, the steepest curve on this graph, the larger effect is the number of different kinds of plants that people eat an even bigger effect than age or inflammatory bowel disease or antibiotic use or other things you have less control over. And we know that we can modify our microbiomes in important ways. So this is just to reorient you on the map, and sorry to do this right uh, to you right before lunch, but if we look at people with C. diff, uh, which is a profound form of diarrhea, you can see those orange spikes for their fecal samples are in a totally different part of the map from the healthy people in brown. And what's going to happen is that four of these patients are going to get a fecal transplant from one donor, and what you see is when we do this, um, uh, and each frame of this is going to be just one day in the animation, what you see is their gut ecology changes completely so that in just one day, all four of them go into the healthy place on the map. And so you can transform your gut ecology in ways that restore your health. So uh, what we're trying to figure out at the moment is for what diseases, and there are many diseases now uh, ranging, um, that have been linked to the microbiome, um, Ranging from, ranging from heart disease to inflammatory bowel disease, uh, to, uh, even, even to cancer and to autism, where we know that there are these aberrant places on the map where perhaps you could restore uh, your correct situation by modifying your microbiome, whether by something as extreme as fecal transplant or something as simple as diet. 
So I'm a little over time and uh, realize that I'm about to incur the, uh, the wrath of the mime. But basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the good and the bad places on the map. And uh, amazingly, uh, when we look at mice, what we see is that the effect of diet is very large. When we look at humans, what we find is that this effect is especially true over the longer term, where what you eat over the last six month period has a huge effect with, for example, high protein uh, leading to more bacteroides and high carbohydrates leading to more Prevotella. Whereas uh, when we look at the short term, what we see is that everyone's samples just cluster together over the short term. And you might have seen this study that was published recently uh, that, uh, that suggests that diet rapidly and, reproduces, uh, and, and irreproducibly alters the human uh, gut microbiome, where if we look at a protein, where, where they looked at a protein-based diet, so something that was eggs, meat, and cheese, they found uh, changes they could detect after just one day. And the same was true of a fiber-based diet, where you had more plants, uh, you had more uh, fiber that feeds the butyrate producers, and so on. But when we do the mapping exercise, uh, what we see, looking at two people, in the study, uh, what we see is that they change a little bit, so on the meat diet in the red region, and on the plant diet in the blue, in the blue region. So you see these systematic changes, but they're in different directions for the, for the different people. And when we put everyone together into the same plot, you can see that although there's changes with the meat and with the plants, in general those differences are small compared to the differences between different people. So you can only change yourself a little bit with what you eat in one day, but with what you eat over, uh, over a year or over a lifetime, that's where you're really changing things. So this idea that you are what you eat is certainly not new. And, um, uh, and uh, Jeff Bland uh, has this wonderful quote that says that food is a language uh, that speaks to our genes. And so, um, so the, way, the way that it does this, we're finding, uh, we're finding now, is that it does this through a, micro, uh, through a microphone that's made of our microbiome, where what we eat is actually changing how our genes work. And so uh, in this context, it's really important that we re-examine ourselves and break down these walls between computer science and medicine and nutrition uh, and uh, all of these other fields that come together to help us understand how to break down the wall between ourselves and our microbes and, uh, to, optimally, uh, and, and, and to optimally eat and drink things uh, in a way that's going to promote, uh, promote our health over a lifetime. Thank you. <laughs> I should drink this.